Welcome everyone to the last in our series of seven target antibiotic webinars. Last week we discussed antibiotics for children. This week we will draw on the information from all the webinars and consider the benefits of a common practice approach as used by Churchill Medical Practice in Kingston-upon-Thames. I'm Professor Cleana McNulty, Head of Public Health England Primary Care Unit and PHE Lead for the Target Antibiotics Project. Here with me today are Dr. Con Connor Jameson, hello Connor, hello. Pharmacy Lead for Antimicrobial Therapy at Sandwell and West Birmingham NHS Trust. Also with me is Dr. Harry, Harry Ahmed, who is a GP at Aberdare, South Wales, and a Clinical Research Fellow at Cardiff University, and he has a special interest in UTI in the elderly. Hello, Harry. Hi. So, we'll now watch key members of the team at Churchill Medical Practice, interviewed by Elizabeth Beach, describe their common practice approach to antibiotic prescribing. While you're watching the video, think about questions you would like to put to us in the live Q&A about this practice approach. You may also have other unanswered questions from the earlier webinars in the series. You can ask questions by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel during or after the video. Sit back and enjoy. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Beach. I work as a national project lead for antimicrobial resistance based in the patient safety team at NHS Improvement. And I'd like to welcome you to Churchill Medical Centre here in Kingston in London who provide care to 25,000 patients. Churchill Medical Centre won a NICE Shared Learning Award in 2014 for a whole practice approach to improving the way they manage respiratory tract infections in patients. This was based on the NICE guidance that was published along a similar theme. And we're here today to talk to various members of the practice about the approach they took, how they developed this strategy and what it's meant for improving patient care and ensuring the appropriate prescribing and use of antibiotics. Hi, I'm Dr Pete Smith. I'm senior partner at Churchill Medical Centre in Kingston. We are a practice of 25,000 patients and we operate across four sites. We have around 20 GPs and a nursing team of at least eight at any one time. Um, several years ago, before the days of Target in a different era, um, we as a team decided that the issue of antibiotic prescribing was one that we wanted to address. Everyone was particularly concerned that there was not a consistent message going across to patients, that pa patients were sent to, tending to hop from one GP to another in the hope of getting an antibiotic which they didn't need in the first place. And although the evidence is very clear that antibiotics were not required, there was a concern at the time from GPs that medically legally they felt they might be at risk if they were refusing an antibiotic and a patient then ran into a problem uh, and complained. So there are a variety of reasons why we decided to start to do something about that. But we particularly started by saying, where is the evidence behind this? If it really is so strong, where is it? What we happened upon at the time was the NICE guidance, which was very, very clear and uniquely for guidance around antibiotic prescribing, it included the duration of illness. And we decided we were going to have a very positive campaign, which we were going to base around self-care because that's been both mine and various other doctors' interests. We were going to have a program that was going to present positive messages to patients about self-care and about why antibiotic treatment was actually worse than self-care and also around the duration. So we were going to concentrate just on a couple of elements of, of a programme and divide it ourselves. We took a multi-professional approach and a multidisciplinary approach where we had a team which included GPs, nurses, receptionists and admin staff so that everybody that might be affected by this programme was involved from the start and that we would have consistent messages. I have to say everybody wanted to be part of it, but in order to make it work, we had to have a group of champions that were prepared to basically lead the way. All you have to do to be a champion, you have to be someone that's prepared to be consistent and give exactly the same message and to be upbeat and enthusiastic about it. That's all that's required. As 
um, the whole practice approach adopted by Churchill Medical Centre supported your professional practice as a clinician? It, well, as such, it's enabled us to all speak with the same ethos. We all say the same thing. It means that I can, you know, happily and comfortably to refuse an antibody if I don't feel it's appropriate, but I can also, the, the, I know the practice will back me if I recognise it is appropriate, but you, you know, you all have the first line of checking whether it's appropriate, and if it's not appropriate, you then go to explain to a patient why it's not appropriate, and you don't prescribe. So, and we, and we all do the same thing, so from my practice, knowing the doctors are doing the same as I'm doing, knowing my colleagues are doing the same as I am, is very supportive. Rebecca is a Deputy Practice Manager with Churchill Medical Practice and has been involved with the model of a whole practice approach from the very start. Can you tell me what that involved? So initially it was a case of trying to gather together information about how things are coded on the notes so that we could set a baseline audit search group for this. Um, we contacted all the clinicians and said if you, for example, if you see a patient with an ear infection, how do you code that on the notes? What code do you put on the notes? And we developed a whole group of searches around that, um, broken down into different disease areas. So we had, for example, acute exacerbation of COPD, acute exacerbation of asthmas, um, sore throat, tonsillitis, ear infection, um, and we actually broke them down into specific diseases. We then looked at how many of the patients in each category were given antibiotics at the time of their visit, um, which meant that we could have a baseline for our starting point on how many patients have been seen with a respiratory infection who were given antibiotics. That was the starting point, which then allowed us to present that to clinicians and the entire practice staff, to be honest, to then develop that into the system that we used, which involved obviously the posters and um, information sheets for clinicians to use in their consultations to assist them. So by asking the clinicians to submit their preferred read coding, mm -hmm. you didn't impose a set of read codes on no. the clinicians, you, no. and clinicians continued to read code to suit themselves. Mm -hmm. And each search contained multitudes of read codes, to be honest. You know, some of them had 10 or 12 different codes for sore throat. It just depended on how people coded things. So, but you, you chose to capture the coding they used yep. rather than yes. impose a, yep. um, a single coding mm -hmm. approach. Um, and how, how did you then use the data you'd collected to say this is what we're doing at the moment to then measure your change? So Pete then collated all the information and we presented it to the staff as, you know, this is where we are now, this is what we'd like to do and we ran the programme for three months and then searched again on exactly the same searches um, and noticed that there'd been a significant reduction in the numbers of antibiotic prescriptions issued. And one of the real challenges with doing these sorts of quality improvement works is sustaining the yes. change and the engagement and mm -hmm. how do you manage that? So we re-audited it every year just to monitor it and presented that information to clinicians. Regular updates do help, little reminders, you know, an email here, an email there. Um, updating the posters, making sure that they're in every room, making sure that they are available to people whenever they're needed, you know, the information sheets for clinicians to show to patients and say, look, this is why I don't think you need antibiotics at this point, and actually reminding people that they're there. Yeah, that's really helpful. And um, as practice managers, you're involved with in introducing new members of staff to the practice. <coughs> so how can you ensure that new members of staff are aware of this approach, this whole practice approach to antimicrobial yep. stewardship? So it's actually included as part of our induction programme for members of staff, particularly clinicians, including all of our registrars. Um, everybody gets to sit down with one of the clinicians and has a discussion about you know, prescribing in general, but also in particular the um, antibiotic prescribing. It forms part of their induction. That's excellent, that's really integrated, it's a real whole practice approach. Um, and in terms of patient complaints, mm -hmm. when you started yep. this approach, how many patient complaints did you experience? Uh, initially there were three or four, um, but it was quite simple to respond to them because it's all evidence-based medicine. Um, you, the responses could include all the nice guidance and links to the relevant information. Um, 
because there was this cohesive practice approach, it got away from the GP hopping aspect, you know, where you go to see one GP who won't give you antibiotics, so a patient thinks, oh, I'll go and see someone else, and they'll get it, and that's, that went, which is why we think we had a few complaints at the beginning. Um, but it, did, it was quite simple to respond to because of the evidence base that you could send out to them. And when was the last time you had a patient complained about not getting access to antibiotics? I don't remember. In all honesty, it was a, it was a while, long time ago. Great. Thanks very much, Rebecca, for sharing no your experience with us. Welcome back. I hope the video has raised lots of questions for Connor and Harry about the approach adopted in the Churchill, pra in Churchill practice. Again, like last week, if you want the Q&A in full screen, click on the icon in the bottom right corner. Please do keep those challenging questions coming. So, um, Harry, Churchill practice um, had this whole team approach. Ella, who's a GP, says that as a GP, she feels really motivated to run a campaign in her practice as, and was wondering if you had any advice for what to do about members of the team that might be less motivated or not as enthusiastic as her. Okay. So, I mean, I think what Churchill Medical Practice did was brilliant, really, embedding the culture of sort of antimicrobial stewardship uh, within to the culture of the practice. Uh, and I suppose what I'd say to Ella is she needs to get buy-in from her, her colleagues, uh, and that buy-in can come from two different areas. Uh, and one is uh, raising awareness of uh, and understanding the importance of sort of the global sort of public health issue related to antimicrobial resistance and how reducing prescribing will help that. Uh, and also how reducing antimicrobial prescribing will help the practice themselves. I mean, there's good evidence that uh, consultations where antimicrobials are safely not prescribed um, to sort of help patients therefore reduce their reconsulting rates um, and also would overall help therefore to reduce practice workload in a safe manner uh, and that's beneficial to the practice as a whole. Any comments on that, Connor? No, I'd agree, absolutely. Um, I think, um, it's important, I think, that um, we can uh, explain the higher order goals, so the real reasons why people are, are taking this whole team approach. And, um, you know, the, the, as Harry mentioned, the public health benefits from reducing prescribing, mm -hmm. uh, um, which are obviously global as well as local, um, and uh, the reduced workload to further downstream for the effort that's put in at the, at the, at the start. Okay, um, Harry, so um, Pete also mentioned they had an antibiotic champion and the manager mentioned. So do you have a champion in your practice and what would be the characteristics that we need? You know, what would you recommend? So, so we don't have an antibiotic champion, but we do have champions for other things. Uh, and so the one that springs to my mind is our influenza champion. So uh, some of the same characteristics would be required for an antibiotic champion. So our, our influenza champion is somebody who really believes in the value of influenza vaccination, uh, who's able to deliver uh, a consistent message across the practice team and is very you know, enthusiastic uh, and positive about the cause. And I think those same characteristics are what we would look for as a practice if we were to have an antibiotic champion as well. So are you going to have one? We will, yeah, we certainly will have one. <laughs> Good, good, good. Okay, so um, also the church of practice discussed giving this positive message to patients um, through giving self-care advice and length of illness advice. How do, you, how do you go about doing that in your practice? So I, I think this is really challenging, especially in the, in the constraints of a, of a 10 minute consultation. Uh, but I think you know, GPs, we're, we're skilled at dealing with these issues in a short period of time. And I think good communication skills, so understanding why the patient is presenting, what their concerns are, uh, which often isn't, they, often patients aren't presenting for antibiotics, they want reassurance that, you know, uh, how severe is their illness, uh, when should they expect to feel better, how long will they need off work. Uh, and so I think explaining these things and uh, assessing the patient clinically so that they feel reassured that their concerns have been addressed will all help, really, in terms of ensuring that the patient understands there's self-care element here and this is a, a self-limiting condition. I think the other thing that's very useful is, is using leaflets and I know there's been one uh, that's been developed by Public Health England um, and this one is, is particularly good because of the way that it explains everything in a, in a very simple manner. Um, so there's simple pictures in here to explain to patients um, what symptoms they will uh, should expect, uh, what they can do to self-manage, how long their symptoms should last 
and also at the end, very, very importantly, good safety netting advice, uh, what they sh when they should represent and with which symptoms they should be concerned about. So that would be particularly useful for people who are not so good, their reading ability is slightly lower. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, this is, uh, this, I think this is ideal for, for all patients, but I would particularly really use it for patients where uh, I, I wanted uh, either people other than the patient to also retain the information. So we're talking about carers and parents, uh, or, or also maybe patients with learning difficulties or patients in care homes, for example. Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, so we've got a question from uh, Rhys. What is the role of the GP trainee in the team around antimicrobial stewardship? So, I mean, the GP trainee is integral to the team. And I think if the GP trainee is in a practice with a very positive culture around antimicrobial stewardship, if the GP trainee can take that culture and the positive message from that practice to his or her other practices and ev eventually to the practice where they themselves become a GP, that, that would be fantastic. I think their role in the practice, something that they could do maybe is the GP trainees we know have to do audits as part of their training and they could possibly get involved with auditing or re-auditing antimicrobial prescribing with a practice and that's something that they could give back to the practice. Um, so I think, yeah, so I think that's two things that GP trainees could certainly get involved with. Okay. And what about um, other trainee pharmacists who go out? What are the role of the pharmacists in, this, in the practice team? Yeah, Robert? well, certainly um, pharmacists are becoming more involved in GP surgeries, um, and I think that's a fantastic thing. Um, there is a, it's a huge scope for the pharmacist to get involved in the management of long-term conditions, asthma, diabetes, and sort of the repeat prescribing that goes around those and optimising that. Um, but certainly practice pharmacists could be very much, uh, be very useful in um, helping with audits. So, uh, you know, I think uh, audits are a key process. If, if people want to audit their practice, then practice-based pharmacists could get involved in that. Community pharmacists have a role as well to play um, in, certainly in, either triaging, uh, sorry that's probably the wrong word to use, but in uh, when patients present to community pharmacy first and sort of recognising if there's any warning signs uh, that, that, that Harry's already mentioned that we might need immediate referral to urgent care um, or uh, a, a sort of less urgent referral to the GP surgery or advice on how to self-manage. And similarly, if patients are being um, sort of uh, finish their consultation with the GP um, and who's advised maybe going to see community pharmacist for advice on uh, symptoms and products to, to help with that, then they're, they're well placed to, to help with those. And of course they could maybe um, give advice on recurrent UTI and mm -hmm. treatment of that, that would be something and they could keep an eye on the repeat prescriptions because of course we're saying that we shouldn't be we should be reviewing every six months. So, you know, that's Absolutely, uh, and community pharmacists get involved in sort of medicines use reviews um, where they review patients' repeat prescriptions and, you know, uh, that, that happens quite regularly and that would be an ideal opportunity to, to identify that somebody's on a repeat prescription of an antibiotic for a long period of time, uh, you know, ask questions, has this been reviewed, when was it last reviewed, How, you know, if the patient needs to have a urine sample. That type thing. So that takes me on to one of the next questions is what do you think are the most important important audits that a practice should start with. Do you have a suggestion first, Connor? Yeah, I mean, well, absolutely. Um, UTIs are um, a huge area. Um, uh, it, uh, there's a huge number of consultations, so there's going to be probably a large variation around practice within that. Um, and without doing a, a proper audit, I think it would be difficult to understand if there's any variations between, uh, between uh, GPs or, or healthcare professionals who are prescribing in this area. Uh, and, and their colleagues, um, so, so certainly UTIs and the management of upper respiratory tract infection. And of course those who are on prophylaxis for UTI, they're going to be on, on it for long term and they're at greater risk of resistance, so Absolutely. maybe doing an audit and do they really need to mm. be still on prophylaxis? What do you think of that, um, Harry, or is there something else you want no, to look I, at? I think that would be an excellent audit actually, seeing uh, how many patients you've got on prophylaxis and when they were they last reviewed. Um, do we have any idea about whether the prophylaxis has helped? You know, have they reduced the amount of uh, acute UTIs they've had and the acute prescriptions that they've had? Because if not, then obviously the prophylaxis is not helping. And then, so certainly yeah, assessing whether uh, the prophylaxis has been reviewed, whether there's resistance to the antibiotic that's been prescribed, very useful audit. Okay, that's a, a good one. Any other audits you'd like to do? I think it, it, as a practice, it would be, would be very useful to audit your overall antimicrobial prescribing across the board. So per clinician, you know, how many antibiotics per clinician are prescribed per patient seen, to see whether there's clinical level variation, and if there is, 
Why is that? Is that because we're seeing different types of patients as a clinician or is that because we're managing patients in a different way? And I think it goes back to what uh, Churchill Medical Practice were talking about, about having a consistent approach across clinicians within a practice as to how you approach antibiotic prescribing. So one of our last webinar leads, I think it was Paul or Steve, said he was quite surprised about some of the things they found. So have you had found anything surprising in your practice when you've been doing an audit? Yeah, I mean, we audited our uh, antimicrobial prescribing across the board, and we noticed that although our overall antimicrobial prescribing was decreasing, we actually have noticed an increase in our prescribing of specific antibiotics, most noticeably Comoxiclar. So this is something that we are now looking at to see why has our comoxiclav prescribing increased in the context of an overall decrease uh, to try and see if we can address that. So again, we could reiterate where we should be using comoxiclav, Connor. So um, yes, I think it was covered in a previous uh, question and answer session, but it was things like uh, pyelonephritis, um, facial cellulitis. Um, although there was a bit of discussion around the appropriateness of that term, um, diverticulitis. And, uh, and uh, bites, I believe, is human yeah. or animal bites as well. Uh, well, one option for human or animal yes. bites. So what about diverticulitis? Because there's been quite a lot of discussion about that. Do you think there's overuse of antibiotics in diverticulitis? Well, you know, I think diverticulitis is one of these conditions where, you know, it's, it's very difficult to diagnose accurately in primary care. And I think, you know, we have to rely on our clinical judgment as to how, you know, how, how, how do, we, do we think this is actually diverticulitis, you know? I mean, my approach tends to be that if somebody has got known diverticular disease, uh, or, or known by previous uh, imaging or, or, or endoscopy, uh, and they come in with signs of, of, of acute left iliac loss of pain with abdominal distension or abdo abdominal tenderness, particularly if the patient says, you know, I've had diverticulitis before and this feels exactly the same, then I, I would probably err on diagnosing, yes, this may be diverticulitis and we may need antibiotics here. I, I think one of the, the hardest things about diverticulitis is there's, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of anxiety about what would happen if this patient wasn't treated with antibiotics. You know, we don't really know a lot about uh, what our other options are in primary care. So I think maybe we do tend to err towards antibiotic prescribing more often than we need to in this, in, in this, this situation. So um, my next question is, um, why do we need to re-audit? So um, you were saying, well, we've, you find a reduction in total antibiotic use. Why do you need to therefore re-audit, you know, because you're doing all right? Well, I think we need to re-audit to, first of all, make sure that we are still improving. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we're not, as we, as we found out with the coimoxiclav issue, audit all may very well throw up surprises that, that we're not expecting. Uh, and that's why it's very important to re-audit. I think re-audit regularly as well particularly in the context of a, a whole practice sort of approach to antimicrobial stewardship. If we're not re-auditing, people don't know how well they're doing. And you sort of lose the momentum of that mm. campaign that you're trying to create within your practice. Yeah. And, you know, if it's showing a positive change, it's sustaining that and, and spreading that news that the, sustain, you know, the change has been sustained. People are doing well, keep it good work, keep it up. You know? And you could see where the improvements are being made and where more improvements need to be made if Absolutely. you look at specific. So in Churchill, they looked at tonsillitis, they looked at ear infection, um, cough, acute cough, a UTI. They looked at various different things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, so I've got a question from Zoe. Um, really about delayed um, backup antibiotics. Have you got any tips? Um, do you use it and when do you use it and when do you not use it? So delayed antibiotics, um, I mean, they are helpful, but I think they need to be used in specific patient populations. So I, I have concerns about using delayed antibiotic prescribing in uh, the very young and the very old. And the reason for that is our message with delayed antibiotic prescribing is you know, if you get worse, if your symptoms worsen, then here's some antibiotics for you to take. But I think in those two groups, the very young and the very old, if their symptoms get worse, I would much rather see the patient and assess them clinically and then prescribe antibiotics if necessary than for the patient to feel reassured by this prescription and take antibiotics off their own, off their own back. Okay. So, um, Harry, now you, you have expertise in the elderly, okay? Um, how, how are you involved in prescribing in the elderly and how can we improve practice in this area, especially in care homes and patients with dementia? So I think one of the things we really need to move away from in prescribing antibiotics to the elderly is not doing face-to-face -face assessments. And I know most GPs do do face-to-face -face assessments, but I also know that 
there is some prescribing, antibiotic prescribing that occurs with telephone consultations. I think this group of patients is, is so complex in terms of their other medical problems um, that really if we are suspecting an infection, they should have a face-to-face -face clinical assessment before we prescribe antibiotics. I also think we need to move away from prescribing antibiotics based on, for example, just urine dipsticks when these get phoned in from care homes. You know, it's, it's a common scenario, get a phone call from a care home uh, staff member to say that uh, you know, Mrs. Jones maybe is a little bit off her legs or not eating as much as normal and they've dipped the urine and they've detected something positive in the urine and then antibiotics get prescribed for a presumed UTI. I think you know, UTI is overdiagnosed in this population and I think we need to really change the way we, we address UTI and, and change our diagnostic approach to UTI in this population. Okay, Connor, I've got a really excellent question for you. Okay, okay from S. Muscat, I'm not sure what her first name is, but um, or his, but um, it's really talking about whether we need to follow instructions in the BNF, whether we need to take things three times a day or four times a day. So penicillins, we've got flucloxacillin, 500 milligrams, uh, four, four times a day, and amoxicillin twice a day, and penicillin four times a day. So how important is it to stick to that, or can we just use the same dose twice a day? Um, it's important, I think, to stick to it as closely as you can. And certainly in secondary care, we very much encourage our prescribers to prescribe at appropriate dosing intervals, eight hourly, six hourly apart, and trying to stick to those uh, as much as possible. Obviously in community, uh, and there's concerns about compliance with medications at the best of times, and then adding in an antibiotic or something that nice needs to be taken an hour before food or four times a day is quite, can be quite a burden, especially for the elderly, uh, or if you have young children. Um, but really, if you think about how the certainly kinetics of the penicillins and the pharmacodynamics and how you're trying to maintain a certain blood level over a time um, and of, you know, above the MIC for 40% of the dosing interval, it's really important, to, certainly with those antibiotics, to uh, dose space them out throughout the day. Um, yeah. There might be some minor adjustments required for their lifestyle for that period of time, but it's worth stressing that and encouraging the patients to do that to, to see the benefit. What about the alternative? I know we have in the guidance, for instance, that we could use flucloxacillin at double the dose twice a day, so that you're, you're going much higher, and so you're getting a much higher concentration you each are. time, so yeah. that's another possibility. That, it is a possibility, of course, but it's a question of how quickly that concentration then drops off over time. Now, if you've had a, a, maybe an older patient who's got poor renal function, you might expect the half-life to be a bit longer uh, and that they wouldn't necessarily clear that. But for adult, young adults with good renal function and stuff like that, they could be clearing that penicillin quite quickly. Um, and also the other factor to bear in mind is things like drugs like flucloxacillin do cause quite a lot of stomach upset and nausea. Mm -hmm. So if you're doubling the dose to, to reduce the frequency, you might see more side effects. Yes, yeah, so you've got to warn them there's about a, that. There's a warn them about that if you're going to do that. And there's a balance and there's no perfect approach for all patients. And often you will have to negotiate with the patients as to how they're going to manage this with their lifestyle. Okay, um, that's that one. Okay, so now I've got a question for you, Harry. So from somebody who says, if you feel um, clinically that an antibiotic isn't indicated and you share the treat your infection leaflet, but the parents still insist on, ha on antibiotics, should you still fight it? What can you do? Well, I think that's a really challenging consultation. And I would take a step back from that consultation, really, and, and try to go back to understanding what is it that mum or dad are really worried about. Are they worried that this is a serious illness now? Are they worried that this is going to develop into a serious illness tomorrow or in a couple of days? Have they had previous experiences where the child has presented with similar symptoms and then gone on to develop a serious illness? And I think addressing those, uh, those, uh, those uh, concerns is going to be vitally important. And I think if you've clinically assessed the child and you, you are absolutely uh, certain in your, in your, with your clinical judgment that this is not a serious illness that requires antibiotics, I think you need to, to reconvey that to the parents. And I think sometimes what helps, or from my own personal experience, what helps is offering parents uh, a, a regular sort of a follow-up appointment. So I sometimes say to parents, listen, I'm, I'm not in, I don't think this uh, is, is a serious illness. Uh, I think this is a, a, a viral illness. I think this will get better given time. I think you're doing all the right things keep making sure that the little one drinks, keep an eye on whether they're passing urine, uh, let her come back to us if there's uh, worsening of his symptoms, so if he develops a high fever that you can't get down or a new rash. But most importantly, 
why don't you come back and see me tomorrow morning and I will have another little look at him so that they know they've got that safety net, that backup, that if anything was to worsen, they've already got that appointment in their diaries for tomorrow morning. And I think that does sometimes help, giving them something concrete to come back to. Okay, so um, let's move on to quality premium. So um, at the moment we've got a quality premium. So why is the quality premium next year measuring the ratio of nitrofurantoin to trimethoprim? Connor, would that be a good one for you? Yeah, well, it's, it's driven by resistance fundamentally and the very, very high levels of resistance in the elderly who obviously get a lot of treatment for UTIs. Um, we know that the resistance rate varies locally, but it tends to be in the region of 30 to 40 percent in most areas. Uh, and so trimethoprim is becoming a less and less useful empiric choice for treatment of UTI. And on this, on the, uh, following on from that, nitrofurantoin resistance rates tend to be very, very low. Um, two to three percent, I think, uh, in, certainly in the West Midlands region, and so it's a very, very good for empiric first choice for you know a, a taking into account other variables such as renal function as well. So reducing the trimethoprim burden um, and the uh, was more likely to result in better outcomes and possibly you know pr slow the progression of what was initially an initial minor UTI to something more serious developing and because of, of resistance. Of course there's been an increase in E. coli bacteremias that's, and yeah. so we're mm -hmm. particularly concerned about that and so that's a target. Yes. So um, do you use nitrofurantoin in your practice Harry because um, I vividly remember a conversation with a GP practice when I went to say encouraging nitrofurantoin and one GP said he wouldn't give it to his dog, let alone <laughs> one of his patients. So what are your opinions about that? So yeah, I, I do use nitrofurantoin extensively. I, I tend to go for the 100 milligrams MR BD rather than the 50 milligrams four times a day. So MR, what do you mean? Mod Modified release. Yes. Uh, easier for the patients to take it twice a day than to take it four times a day. And it's actually more cost effective than the four time daily dosing as well. Um, I mean, anecdotally, I don't uh, recall many patients coming back reporting side effects that have made them want to stop it. Uh, and exactly like Connor says, you know, you know you're more likely to get it right first time with the nitrofurantoin due to the increasing resistance rates to trimethoprim. Uh, the only patient I'm careful of I is in those with problems with their renal function. So mm -hmm. uh, those with a renal function, or EGFR less than 45, I tend to avoid it unless absolutely essential. So what would you use in somebody with poor renal function? Um, um, you've got a couple of options. You could always try trimethoprim because um, the cutoff for that is, a, is lower, um, but bearing in mind the caveat that the resistance is extremely high. Um, so maybe if, we're, if we've got somebody with poor renal function, maybe we should be sending a culture um, for sensitivity in that case. Yeah, probably yeah. helpful, but I suppose there'll be times when you do need to treat straight away. Yes. Um, but you've got options like pivmacillinam, which is... Um, penicillin so not suitable for everybody unfortunately but that's another good choice uh, and it's it's good for a lot of resistant organisms as well and then you have um, what's I think now available in primary care is phosphomycin sachets so it's a, a three gram single dose sachet for uncomplicated UTI in females uh, and in males I think and is that it. readily available now because there's been you know problems getting mm. hold of that yes I mean we always used to have to use an unlicensed capsule in secondary care but now there is a, a three gram sachet which is available for primary care um, and we're also using that in hospitals as well. Um, the benefit is it's just a single dose, so it's great for compliance if you can get that initial dose into the patient um, with its long uh, half-life and high urinary concentrations. It's, it's just a single treatment for, for female patients with uncomplicated UTI. And what about a nitrofurantoin, um, Harry, if you're worried about somebody might, you know, they've got a bit of loin pain or something, you know, so because nitrofurantoin is only for lower... UTI. So, where do you have your cutoff? What's your situ You know, when do you decide not to use it? Well, I think it depends. You know, what you mean by a, a bit of loin pain, and, and I think if somebody did have a little bit of loin pain, you know, so they've got, uh, you know, urinary frequency and a little bit of loin pain, but you know, they're not febrile, they're not systemically unwell, they've got no history of rigors or anything that makes me really uh, think about pyelonephritis. I would still use the nitrofurantoin. It's only if I was really worried about pyelonephritis, so this person sitting in front of me is really unwell. You know, they're sweating. They're a temperature greater than 38, they're tachycardic, or they've got significant renal t angle tenderness, that, that I would think about pyelonephritis, and I would probably then um, you know, uh, uh, not use nitrofurantoin and, and, and use something more significant. Okay, so going back to um, qu quality premiums, what are the risks of financial incentives for GPs to reduce antibiotic prescribing, is the data actually robust enough for us to actually say, look, incentives work, and it works at the local level? 
So, well, I'd certainly say that certainly the, the quality of the data in terms of packed data and stuff like that is, 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 very, um, is very high because it comes direct from the NHS business services. So you can have, quality, you can have assurance about the, sort of the, the quality. The data of the, that's been collected that is correct. has been collected. Yes. Yeah. Um, in terms of financial incentives, um, I think they're probably uh, a short-term thing. And I think the evidence is that there's the effect that you get from the financial incentive isn't sustained long term, uh, but I think they're quite a useful method for pump priming um, the, the the stewardship agenda. It certainly worked very well in secondary care when the Department of Health funded uh, antibiotic pharmacists uh, in about 2003, and we've seen uh, you know the benefit of that in secondary care. Um, so I think it does drive improvement, but it's not it can't be the only uh, measure mm -hmm. to use. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Connor. I mean, as, as Churchill Medical Practice showed, when we were without a financial incentive, embedding that culture of, of antimicrobial stewardship within their practice and having that consistent approach as, as, as uh, you know, done, done, they've done brilliantly just using that approach where, um, you know, they've used sort of, I suppose, uh, the reward of a better clinical care um, rather than financial incentives to, to improve their practice. So if a CCG was going to do something on a whole CCG basis, um, to support the quality premium, what sort of thing do you think they could do for the whole CCG to take it forward in the current climate? Again, it's um, you know facilitating these type of things uh, or educational events. Uh, certainly, I've been involved in some uh, educational events for GPs that were organised by our one of our local CCGs, and that was very useful to bring people into a room and um, actually come up with a. a people left the room with an action plan of three simple measures that they could do and implement by the... In their practice. In their practice that they could do every day and be consistent mm -hmm. with it. So nothing too uh, complicated, but it was, you know, having information available in at the, t you know, at the point of consultation, posters, uh, leaflets as well, and making sure that locum medical staff as well, for example, were following the same, the, you know, this, this common practice approach that we've talked about. Um, so I think CCGs facilitating that is a very useful starting point. Uh, and there'll be local issues that will um, arise from those discussions, which you know the CCG can then address. And I suppose we should point out that the quality premium doesn't go to the general practice, does it? It's just for as the CCG. Is that right? As I understand it, I think you probably might be better placed than me to to say that. But yeah, yeah, I yeah. believe that's the case. I think one of the things the CCG could do is is all of this sort of th sort of stuff takes time. But I think they could. There's practical things that they can do to support practices, particularly smaller practices. So, for example, small practice may require some pharmacist time to come in and run the audits. They may not have the skills or the knowledge within the practice themselves to run their baseline audits. They may require costs to cover locum cover while they sit together as, as a practice and discuss the results of their audit uh, and put an action plan together. So these things are what the CCG could really practically help practices do in order to get up and running with these sort of plans. And also they could, um, so they, we've got these leaflets now, so that we mentioned... Um, in the UTI webinar, the UTI leaflet. So this is available. So CCGs could get these printed mm -hmm. and used. So they can, um, they're available in Word, so you can change them for, to suit local things. Are they available in different languages or? Uh, no, the UTI one isn't, okay. but the treating your infection. Yeah. So this one is for respiratory tract infections. This is now available, I think in over 10 different languages now. So um, this, um, Either CCGs could make this available as a leaflet hard copy, or maybe somebody could go out to the practices from the CCG to make sure that their EMIS or System 1 computers are set up for this. Yeah. So um, also we have, it's, you know, you can go onto the System 1 and um, EMIS website to find out how to make sure that these do come up. So we are going to see if we can get the UTI leaflet on the website as well. So um, that's something um, CCGs could do. And sorry, did you mention there was community pharmacy versions oh, available yes. as well? Oh, yes, so yes. the CCG could support their community pharmacies as well? Yes, so what else do you think um, CCGs could do around community pharmacies? Well, again, um, I think very much uh, similar to, to, to practices, you know, they're, they're independent uh, contractors, so bringing them together for educational events is quite useful. Um, 
you know, often it's like an evening uh, uh, CPD event or something like that, but to raise awareness, because obviously uh, a lot of community pharmacies, there might be just one or two community pharmacies in them that might be open for extended hours, so they will need some support to get involved. Um, and really signing up to be an antibiotic guardian, raising awareness of that, the Antibiotic Awareness Day that takes place each year, uh, but certainly making leaflets available that that can be used during a consultation, so minor ailment schemes as well, for example, supporting those which might well then take pressure off GP surgeries. So there's lots of things they could do. So how low do you think we could go, Harry? Somebody's saying, you know, we've got quite low um, rates of prescribing in our area. How low do you think we could go in England? Do you think we could go a lot lower? I think we could go lower. I mean, if we look across the board, there's still you know, marked variation across practices mm. in the, 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 the volumes of antibiotics prescribed. Um, you know, and I think so, practices certainly at one end could come down lower so they're closer to practices at the other end. But I think as a, as a country as a whole, we're, we, we, don't, we prescribe far more antibiotics than other countries in Europe, for example, the uh, Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands. So I think there is a way to go yet. So even the lower prescribing practices could go even lower and I think that's if you look at the um, there's a little video clip on the website from Pete Smith about an audit he was saying that actually they had low prescribing mm. and yet they reduced their prescribing even more oh, so yeah. so um, there is a real opportunity even in um, low prescribing um, practices okay let's see what other questions we have so um, another question for you I don't know whether we um, cover this completely, but Tanya said, what is the role of dipsticks in the diagnosis of UTI in routine general practice? So really, we should only be using dipsticks if we're uncertain whether this is a UTI or not. So in, a, in somebody who comes in with maybe only two symptoms or mild symptoms of a UTI, and we think we need a little bit more evidence whether this is a UTI or not, that's when we should be using a, a dipstick, just to give us that little extra bit of clinical evidence that we need to, to justify uh, diagnosing a UTI and possibly prescribing antibiotics. The one caveat with that, though, is in the elderly, and, and I think in the elderly, really, urine dipsticks have got very little role in the diagnosis of UTI, and it should be based on, on, on a clinical assessment, uh, and if you think this is a UTI, then we should be sending that urine off for culture, and we shouldn't be doing a dipstick. Okay, and so there's another question for you, Connor, about E. coli bacteremias. Okay. So E. coli bacteremias have increased. Mm -hmm. Have they increased just because we're better at detecting them, or is it a real increase? Very good question, and I'm not sure I actually know the answer. Um, certainly, it, 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 when you're working in secondary care, as I do, it really does feel like they have increased. Um, I'm not sure what has changed in the detection, because um, it's still... You know the traditional same method. technique is same the same. We're you know, culturing it. That yeah, hasn't changed. That hasn't has changed. It? I mean, I would imagine it's it's the, the, it's been driven by uh, increased catheterizations, for example, in primary care or in care homes and stuff like that, or increasing use of long-term catheters, that type of thing. Um, and, and yeah, we certainly see so much coming in from community and secondary care. Increase in the elderly population. Yeah, uh, you know, increasing comorbidities. People living for longer. Um, people having more medical treatments, more interventions as well. There's a whole host of factors. Okay. Um, and the one or two other odd questions, um, and maybe I can answer this. Can, can a CRP test be used for children to aid decision making? Do you know that? Because I think the, there, hasn't, there haven't been any, any trials in children at all. So um, we still need to watch that space. There still need to be some studies that are done for that. Um, if you're using prophylactic antibiotics for recurrent UTI, Harry, how often do you review them? That was another question. Well, I think the best practice guide, like, guidance all says that we should be reviewing prophylactic antibiotic use uh, at least every six months. Uh, reviewing their use, uh, seeing if they've uh, had a, any sort of beneficial effect, also assessing if they've caused any, any negative effect uh, and reassessing whether they need to be continued uh, at a six-month period. Uh, and when we say reassess whether they need to be continued, we also need to reassess whether the same antibiotic needs to be continued or whether the resistance has developed and we should be switching to another antibiotic because although there is an effect, it's likely that because of resistance, that effect is now going to, uh, going to um, be minimised. Well, that's the end of this seventh and final webinar and many thanks for participating. I do hope this series has given you everything you need to help you improve antibiotic prescribing in your clinical setting. Don't forget to explore the Target webinar website to find all the materials. You can replay the interviews 
and you will also find links to the studies and resources discussed. You will soon be receiving an email asking you to reflect on how you may take forward actions suggested in this webinar and giving us some feedback. Please do complete this if possible, as it will help us all to improve. Thank you again for watching. We know many of you are accessing the materials on the website and this resource will remain available to at least April 2017. If you are registered, we will keep you informed of any updates and further webinars. From all the team at PHE and BSAC, thank you. It's been a joy for me and the team to learn so much from all our presenters, panellists and participants over the last seven weeks. Enjoy your antimicrobial stewardship. Goodbye.